Let everybody get into the room. Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dana DeFillaby coming from you, uh, coming to you from my home office in Virginia. For those of you who do not know me, I am a BIM technologist or leader of computational design at Smith Group. Uh, I am active participant in many BIM groups, including Your Desk University. We're going to hear from Tim and later. Also a podcast called BIM Thoughts and my very own YouTube channel, Dynamo BIM. Five user groups across the East Coast come together to bring you the BIM XT network. This network is luckily ran by a board of advisors, so not just me, I promise. And we really come together to make this all about you guys, the participants and BIM experts. We want to connect you on processes and tools related to building modeling. As a side note, all of these are recording, as you may have heard, the pop-up notice. So these are all provided for you in the future. You can get to this as well as all of our previous recordings on our LinkedIn group. This group is also intended to foster conversations and connections, once again, about you. Today's topic I am super excited about. Once again, I am a leader in computational design at Smith Group. And today we are talking about automation in the design process. Three really, really wonderful presenters uh, going to talk about their perspectives on this topic. So first up, we have Sonal Singh, the co-founder and CEO of Spatiometrics. Next up, as I mentioned, Tim and Hazel. He is an associate and senior technical designer at Walter P. Moore, but you may know him through your desk university. And finally joining us is Heather Leck, the product manager at Autodesk. I said those in a little bit of improper order. You can see on the screen, that's the order they're gonna be. After the presentation, we will have a short discussion where we wanna hear from you guys. Uh, before we get started today, random winner, Congratulations, Andy Schrader, for filling out our survey. We do give out a random $25 gift card to a survey participant. So make sure that when you see that email or in the chat, when you see that link from Allison come up, you click on it, do the survey super, super quick, and you could win $25 next month. Um, and one thing, like I mentioned, that makes us really, really awesome about this group is you. Make sure that you're chatting, whether it's about your experience, if you have a question about what you're hearing, the presentation, maybe it's something about automation in general that you've been wondering. We want to hear about it. So make sure that you're opening up that chat and using it. We want to hear from you. All right. I'm going to stop talking because we have so many awesome things to talk about. So I'm going to pass it right over to Sonal. How's it going, Sonal? Cool. Um, good, Dana. Thanks for having me. I'm super Sorry, I, I felt like I was just talking so fast because I really didn't want to have a, a long <laughs> intro. Like, get me through it. I want to hear from you. <laughs> so where are you calling from today? All good. Um, yeah, so I'm coming in from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, really excited to, um, you know, have this conversation, talk about the power of automation, but also the power of um, where automation comes in in the design process. So um, what I'm going to do first is um, kind of talk through the theory, if you will, of kind of where, where I'm coming from, my background, um, and the way, the way we see the world, and then we'll jump right into a demo to get uh, a little bit more tactical. Um, so Dana, just let me know if you can see my screen. I sure can. Great. Um, cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Like I said, really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, just for a little bit of background, um, I'm a part of a team called Spatiometrics. Uh, we're a cross-disciplinary team out of MIT, um, and we're coming at it from uh, views of architecture, uh, data, health and wellness more broadly. Um, but the team is really united around this idea that if we have better access to data during the design process, we can fundamentally improve the ways that buildings affect our health and well-being. Um, so like I said, um, I'm going to just talk through, you know, level set on our, my view of the world, if you will, and, you know, put it out there for, for conversation um, on, you know, how data can be leveraged in the design process today. And of course, automation is such an important part of that. Um, but then we'll get into, um, into some examples and tactical applications of what that world could actually look like. Um, and then let's have a conversation. 
Um, so yeah, just to get started, um, you know, to jump right into uh, what I mean when I say kind of, you know, uh, data in the design process or data informed design. Um, of course, that could mean a bunch of different things. Um, there's so many powerful and infinite ways to apply design data in the process. But um, today, what I'm not going to talk about is um, parametric design data, or more commonly known as generative design data, where um, you're kind of leveraging automated design criteria or rule-based checks to automatically generate a floor plan and then evaluate, you know, thousands of options. Um, I'm really going to focus more on leveraging a data feedback loop um, as you're designing, uh, humans are kind of designing a building or going through a design life cycle process. Um, I'm also not going to talk about market research data um, in terms of, you know, leveraging really cool macroeconomic data to, um, you know, predict project capacity of, you know, how many patient rooms should be in a hospital in 10 years or what's the ideal number of seats for a, a sports stadium. Um, what I'm actually going to get into is, um, really kind of an owner centric um, set of curated metrics um, that really kind of capture the quantitative and qualitative aspects of a space. Um, so like I said, this is really kind of focusing on the human factors of design. Um, and of course, you know, what I mean by kind of automated design data, we're talking about automating, calculating uh, travel distances, uh, access to daylight or window access. Um, of course, infection control has been a really big thing. So how do you kind of quantify infection control in a space? Um, of course, things like privacy and supervision, which of course are at, at odds with each other. You can't have a, a supervised and a private space at the same time. So how do you kind of work through those kind of trade-offs? Um, and just like we have tons of automation of facade data or materials data available in early, early design, um, we're looking to bring this kind of quantification to the early phases of design when, and really focus on the owner program and the operational priorities of the space. Um, and what I'm talking about here and the, the metrics that you see on the screen have about 40 years of research behind them in terms of, um, you know, being able to really drive building outcomes when it comes to the actual humans kind of, you know, living and, and being in a space. Um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of capturing this kind of data, um, assessing and integrating this kind of data into the actual iteration process. And then, of course, um, utilizing it more broadly to inform design decisions throughout the life cycle of a building. Um, and again, just to level set, you know, our team is, is really big believers in, in leveraging data to inform design in an evidence-backed way. Um, but let's go through, you know, maybe I'll be an extreme example, but something that's very, very real and that we see a ton of, um, you know, AEC doing today. Um, specifically when it comes, this example is for uh, healthcare design. So um, just to kind of walk through what we see as kind of the process today and how we can try and actually, you know, make it better and, and break down some of the barriers we see. Um, a number of times, let's say, you know, designers and owners and other AEC firms are getting together um, and really trying to identify and inform project goals. Um, you know, if the AEC firm or the owner team has the resources to do so, oftentimes we'll look at precedents or benchmarking or um, really kind of um, phenomenal studies out there from accomplished researchers that are, you know, kind of providing us evidence. And in this case in particular, um, you know, supervision, again, can feel maybe like a holistic or, or theoretical metric, but there's actually a lot of research that starts to pull out that um, whether or not a nurse can see into a patient room in hospital design actually affects patient mortality rates of that room. Um, so with leveraging that kind of benchmarking, um, we can start to all come together at the table, you know, designers, owners, you know, uh, project managers alike, and say, okay, that's the kind of evidence that we have at stake today. Um, we really want to make sure that we maximize staff supervision in this upcoming project. Well, um, Sonal, and this is something that is super relatable to me, right? Yeah. I know many of you guys probably know that I got my start with Dynamo on occupancy, right? And, and yeah. life safety and all of those things surrounding it. So right. I want to see and hear from you guys, what discipline are you calling from? And if you are in the chat, do you do this type of stuff? right? Does it seem like this is data that you're already trying to accumulate within your own personal studies in terms of whether it, maybe it's healthcare, like, like Sonal's talking about, or some other industry that we're, they're all, all so related to. So I'll give you guys another second. We're about 64%. Give you guys another second, get everybody accounted for. And we also love hearing if, if you're not um, seeing your specific discipline accounted for here, let us know in the chat. We will try to get it added in there. So share the results here. Of course, architecture interior. So like me, you guys, I'm sure are very, very relatable. You guys are having a lot of the same questions come up in your day-to-day -day practices. So I will, I will not interrupt. 
again, continue on. Yeah. And, and Dana, it's something that we hear all of the time, right? Is that, you know, we know this is kind of in theory, the way you should do it, but where rubber really meets the road is in this kind of evaluating, you know, that try and try again, and then try yet again, uh, phase, right. And we know that, um, you know, if we, if we do a good job of kind of informing project goals and setting that design criteria, the, the power really comes in this kind of evaluation cycle. Um, and of course, you know, again, this example is uh, admittedly simplistic because we're not just going to look at, you know, one metric like supervision, we're going to be battling hundreds of design parameters um, that I had on the previous screen. And it's, you know, it, it's your guess versus mine in terms of where priority should lie. And, you know, how do we drive consensus around what really matters here? Right, absolutely. Um, and that's honestly what we what we hear time and time again is that so many people are, are super excited about leveraging design data. Um, but we know that it's it's really hard. You know, we know that um, activities like benchmarking and visualizing data takes the data science skill set and AEC firms or owner teams may just not have that skill set in house. Um, we also know that running these kinds of analyses take a ton of time and that's expensive. Um, it takes away from, you know, designers or facility managers actually driving the, the building strategy. Um, and we know that time is a really valuable resource, especially when it comes to not being able to justify this kind of analysis or those hours internally. Um, so we hear all the time that like, I would love to do this. I just can't apply it to a single project. And so I, I don't have time or effort or resources to do this kind of analysis. Um, and the last thing we hear um, often is that, you know, even if a firm is really starting to dive into this kind of, you know, automation culture or analysis culture, um, efforts aren't always coordinated. And so, you know, you may be able to squeeze out some really cool analysis for designing for a specific project and really building custom design criteria, but learning across projects is still really hard. And without a centralized, you know, knowledge repository of sorts, um, we really can't build on that project to project knowledge without a ton of extra effort and time, which you know often gets deprioritized. Um, so when, when our team took a step back and asked ourselves like, okay, how do we overcome these barriers? Um, we actually identified three areas that we could really put our mind to in terms of addressing these hurdles so that we can use, um, you know, not just automation, but data more broadly in the design process. Um, so of course, you know, the theme of, of this talk is um, you know, automation of that, those types of analyses. And that for us is really just table stakes. You know, it has to be quick and easy to measure any metric, every metric that a designer or owner or both care about. Um, but, you know, we can't really stop at the automation. We also have to make sure that when you kind of generate that really valuable data, that you have ways to visually digest it. So are there better ways that we can communicate the value of design, communicate the value of these trade-offs, in a way that you can play back what you're hearing, you can actually drive project consensus a lot faster and gain clarity in early phases of the design and have that carry through to the end. Um, and so this is actually something that we've heard are kind of one of the biggest barriers is like, even though we generate a ton of awesome data, I don't know how to digest it. I don't know how to share it in a way that everybody at the table can understand. Um, and then of course, you know, when you start to leverage this kind of automation project by project, you now have that consistent structured data set to start to get into benchmarking. Um, and if the group will allow me to kind of, you know, go off on a limb for a second, we actually want to take that kind of data set one step further and actually start to open up completely new opportunities for the design practice. So um, the, the team at Spatiometrics is actually uh, working with support from the National Science Foundation um, to build a recommendation engine that would use techniques for those who are familiar, like neural networks and ablation analyses to actually start to connect disparate data sources. So we're talking about connecting spatial data that's really inconsistent and kind of sporadic today, making that really consistent and structured, but then also start to pull in data like outcome data and actually make connections that will move the needle on an owner's KPIs. You know, if you really want to prioritize productivity or you really want to prioritize health outcomes um, or you really want to prioritize um, collaboration, right? There's, there's now kind of a path you know, again, it's a little bit forward thinking, but um, we really believe that there's a really clear path to be able to using this kind of engine in the design process itself. And, you know, just to kind of come down before we get into the, the demo, you know, at the end of the day, like, why, why do we care? Why do we care about the human factors of design? Um, well, it, it actually kind of permeates so that everybody wins, right? We know that architects can leverage that kind of design data to drive design decisions. We know that then owners can better achieve their organizational goals because their goals are prioritized in the design process. And of course, at the end of the day, all of us on this call are more healthy, productive, and collaborative in these spaces. And so we know that health, productivity, and well-being is 
um, really the kind of end goal of design. And not only is it becoming really kind of powerful in terms of the oath that we as an AEC industry take, um, but now there's research from companies like JLL that actually show that um, financially, there's almost a hundred times bigger return on these aspects of design compared to even square footage or uh, energy bills alone. So we're really excited about this kind of emerging, um, you know, source of data, if you will. Um, and we know that a ton of people in the industry are doing a lot of innovative work around it. So um, I'm really excited about that, but I also want to dive into kind of, okay, that's all great, you know, in theory, but like, what does that look like in practice? And so if you imagine, you know, the ability to automate these kind of analyses in stride, what that really allows you to do is upload a floor plan, whether that's a benchmark, whether that's an iteration, really anything, and then have it automatically analyzed for you. And then the ability to kind of interact with it, visualize it, and then drive holistic design decisions as a result. So with that, I'm gonna pause really briefly and pull up an example. <clears throat> so data, uh, keep me honest, can you see this? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Awesome. So let's assume that, you know, through the power of automation, we've uploaded a series of floor plans. And now each of these floor plans actually has a set of data behind it. Um, so whether it's, you know, the things we were talking about, views, uh, program, um, window access, uh, you know, travel distances, things like that. All of this data is now embedded and sitting behind the floor plan. Um, this looks so, so it, helpful, you guys, right? Look at this dashboard. It's all there. You know, it's all sitting in the back, but you can actually pull it kind of as and when you need, right? Um, so let's assume, let's go through an example. And I know we're coming up on time, Dana, so I'll just run through a couple of quick ones. Um, but let's say we're going through pre-design for all the, the architects and uh, the interiors out there. Um, so let's assume that we're designing a new project, we're going through concept or pre-design, and we're really just evaluating, you know, typologies at a very holistic level. Um, we can actually start to set scorecards and say, okay, here are the kind of easy things that we start to set um, in the pre-design process. And then we can actually start to compare and say, okay, from a typology standpoint, these are the true trade-offs that you're making when it comes to things like supervision of a waiting room or, um, you know, the number of, uh, you know, patient program rooms or um, square footage per room or even the views, right? Like these are all things that we're just constantly battling all the time. And now you can actually start to drive consensus and say, okay, like here are the different directions we can go. And maybe a project team will say, you know, okay, after evaluating all these pros and cons of travel distances and window access, we're really going to start to um, align around the racetrack layout. So then maybe you go to the next phase um, and you have a couple of racetrack layouts. And now we're starting to look at things a little bit more deeply. So we've added some more metrics to our scorecard. We're really starting to compare the nuances you know, within a project. Um, maybe we're starting to get really deep into something like, uh, I don't know, supervision. And you can kind of start to compare like metric for metric, like racetrack option one versus racetrack option two. Um, and then we actually take this a step further and we say, okay, maybe a metric in and of itself is helpful, like a single travel distance for egress or something like that. But how do you actually start to tell a story about the ways that people are going to operate in a building? And so we've actually gotten a lot of great feedback on a travel distance tool, which helps people kind of imagine a day in the life. Now, of course, I'm running with a healthcare example here. So this is a day in the life of a nurse. Um, but you can start to actually you know, play around with the data and say, oh, okay, I want to create kind of this like choreography of sorts. Um, maybe I want to add a trip to the med prep room, you know, things like that. And it's not just about playing with the data, right? It's actually about driving the results. And you can see that kind of within these two floor plan layouts, um, over the course of an eight hour shift, a nurse would actually save a half an hour per nurse per shift in just walking. Like that's operational waste out the window. And so this is kind of where the power of data, we get really excited about to say, oh, wow, okay. Like, you know, racetrack layout one it is. And so I think this is really powerful when it comes to kind of driving those conversations. Um, I'll pause there, you know, totally happy to answer um, questions or, you know, really excited to have a dialogue around just kind of the pros and cons and kind of what needs to be done to make that kind of data at your fingertips even easier in schematic design. 
Um, but I will pass it on to the next speaker. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sonal. And I will say that, I mean, once again, just resonates in so many ways. I think of, you know, us as designers getting into the healthcare practice and chatting with the professionals, you know, putting the VR goggles on them and us being able to provide this type of metric and this type of visual for them in addition. I mean, I just think we're, we're really on our way of being able to do this in just such an efficient way, right? Totally. Yeah. It just, it makes it easier to understand and digest. And to your point, like actually experience, right? You can start to picture yourself in this future building or a renovated building. Absolutely. Don't forget to throw your questions as they come up. Maybe, maybe you're questioning, you know, how, how you put that question up there. Cause so much information was just thrown at you. Make sure you check out the website, such good information on there. And we will have a little conversation at the end with Sonal included, included. So make sure you throw them up there. Now, before we get moved over to Heather, I am going to share my screen really quick so that I can actually show you guys the names and titles of all of our presenters in the order that they are in. And while this is going, I actually want to sh- ask you guys, stop sharing the results here and get what region you're calling from. Where are you calling us from today? Once again, if you want to be more explicit in terms of where you're calling, throw it in the chat. Maybe it's not listed there. Maybe you're calling from Asia or Europe. We love South America. We want to know where you're calling from. So make sure you let us know where you're calling from today. Northeast, of course, pretty, pretty topical, uh, typical winter there. It's awesome. Canada, love it. Love it. All right, I'm going to stop sharing the and share the results here. Thank you guys so much. So as you can see here, next up, we have Heather Legg, the project manager from Autodesk. She's gonna be talking about format and automation. So super excited about this presentation. Stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you, Tina. It's great to be here. If my memory serves, I think you're also calling from Massachusetts, aren't you? I am, yeah. I'm just around the corner from Sonal. I'm uh, I'm west of Boston right now. Normally I'd be in the office, which would be in downtown Boston, but not today. Um, Yeah, we're neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I work out of the Autodesk Boston office. Um, As Dana mentioned, I'm the product manager at Autodesk for a product called Formit, which is an early stage design tool. I'm gonna give like a one minute video just sort of to give an overview of that. And then I'm gonna go into how Formit connects with Dynamo uh, visual scripting to do some um, computational design and how that works within Formit, which is a little bit unique from, you know, the the more common implementation of Revit. Um, So let's see, with that, let me share my screen. And I'm going to show this video and I don't think I'm sharing audio. So what I'm going to do is just talk through sort of what we're seeing here. And this is just, again, an overview of Formit, which is an early stage design tool for really for architects in the AEC industry. Um, It's just sort of fast, lightweight, easy modeling but it also has lots more um, in terms of materials and 3D um, modeling. It's also available on Windows web and as an iPad app. Um, The Windows app is what you're gonna need to use Dynamo with Formit though. The other two are not connected with, um, with Dynamo. This is an example of the connection between Formit and Revit, which is available through the AEC collection um, as of this past global launch in April. Um, and of course, this is the area that we'll talk a little bit more about today in terms of format and Dynamo and how you can control those Dynamo scripts right from the format interface um, and use a lot of samples that are shipped out of the box with format. Additionally, um, you know, as, as Sonal was talking about just all that analysis that we want to be able to do upfront so we could really inform designs, we can do a lot of environmental analysis inside of Formit with really very basic kind of massing um, information and a site location. So we can use, we can go directly into insight energy analysis as well, directly from Formit. And again, kind of get that informed design. So with that, I'm going to show, this is the Formit interface here. And I'm, um, so again, this is sort of a, I brought some 3D context in actually from InfraWorks 
And then what I'm going to focus in here on is um, sort of I have this model, this lightweight model here, sort of schematic early stage design model. And um, so within the format interface over here on the right, halfway down, let's see if I, let's see is working. Um, there's a Dynamo panel here. You can see that little symbol for Dynamo. And Dynamo, if you're not familiar, Dynamo is Autodesk's visual scripting language um, for the AEC industry. And it's definitely very common inside of Revit, but also has uh, uh, implementations inside of Format, Civil 3D, and a couple other applications as well. And I should say before I get started that Format Pro is what I'm showing here. And this is available through the AEC collection. So this is the format Windows version. And that's what you need to, to access Dynamo here. So up in the top right-hand corner of the palette on the far right is this little Dynamo symbol. Mm -hmm. Actually, if I click that, that will launch Dynamo. Just so, so you know, if you want a, a brand new empty Dynamo file, you can launch it directly from there. But what I'm gonna show here are some various samples um, that come, all of these samples here in this palette, they come with, um, with format as just out of the box format. Now, these are just pointing to a library of samples. I can add Dynamo scripts by pointing to different locations where I, uh, I would be, I would just go and browse to a folder here that has other Dyn scripts in it. And I could also have access to that. Uh, from this pull down menu here. But here I only have the one folder going to my default Dynamo samples. Well, and let us now, know in the chat also if you guys use Dynamo outside of Revit, whether that's through Sandbox or Civil 3D or Formit. I'd love to know if you guys are using Revit uh, Dynamo in some other way. So sorry, Heather, continue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're not, maybe tell us if you might try it out with Format Dynamo in the future once you see all the cool things it can do. So a few things um, I wanted to show are, there are a couple and under this building massing um, folder here, there are a couple different ways I can start, I can use a Dynamo script. So this is mass by outline. And if I click this button, you'll see I'm prompted to pick a, um, a selection here. And I'm gonna do that uh, by, tab selecting those four lines there, and I click the checkbox. And what you can see over on, on the right-hand side, this is what this is doing is opening a Dynamo script in the background and calculating through a script. And what that did was it generated a, a box element. Basically, I'm, I'm showing like what could happen if I add an addition, a vertical addition to this building. And in the properties over here, you can see I'm getting various, um, Various, I can make various edits. So here, maybe I want to change the, the number of floors to 12. Um, first floor height is set at 14, because um, maybe it's a little bit bigger. Um, and then typical floor height, maybe I'll change that to 11. And I can rerun that graph by clicking Run, and that will immediately update. And down at the bottom here, you can see I'm getting some reports. Um, and these are watch nodes showing me the typical floor area, which is about 26,000 square feet, and then also the total floor area. So very quickly, I get a sense of like what, how that would generate a building. Um, another thing I can do is instead of picking sort of a site area that I want to place a building on, I can pick a path or an outline for a building. And that's this multifamily along path. And I have a path here of these three lines already um, drawn. So I'm just going to click on that. And this is going to generate a little bit of a different form of a massing um, model. And what I'll do next is I'll open the Dynamo script and we can check that out a little bit. So here again, you'll see I have these same or um, different parameters actually, but I still get readouts. And what I can do from here is click this in edit embedded graph. So I'm going to click edit embedded graph. And what that's going to do is open the actual Dynamo graph that is um, creating this geometry inside of Formit. And while that opens, I'll say, so we're, we use, um, we're always up to date with the latest Dynamo release. So we're with uh, 2.10 right now. And um, we always try to, whenever we release Formit, we also make sure that we upgrade again to that latest Dynamo. So Dynamo is opening here. It does take, just a little bit longer when I'm connected to Zoom. Well, and I do feel like this is just an absolute game changer. 
I mean, being able to not only create these types of forms with an Autodesk program, right, but to be able to automate them in this way. I mean, we all know, um, especially us Grasshopper users, that you know there are some serious geometry limitations within Dynamo and Revit, right? But this allows that that flexibility, and so allowing us to take what we've already learned in Dynamo and bring it over here. Look at this. This is yeah. great. It's a great tool. Um, so within here, um, I'm now within this this graph, and this graph is is live. So what that means is, um, if I try to, well, I'm going to try to move this over. You'll see that I have um, all of these these inputs as I move around here. The um, number of floors, right? And I had um, previously changed that, I think, to something like I'll, I'll go up to twenty now, and you'll see that that's going to automatically update over here, or it should. Yeah, live demos, we'll see. Anyway, this is directly connected. And if I wasn't, there we go. If I wasn't on Zoom right now, it would have just immediately moved. Um, you can also see, so within the Dynamo graph, um, there's, if you access it, Dynamo through format, you see the Dynamo select node. That's what I'm using to select these, um, the path or the outline for my graph. So it's just this right here, this select Dynamo node. And you can rename it so that, you can prompt the user inside a format to select a path or a face or a 3D, 3D geometry, right? And then all of these elements are just set to is output and that's how they'll show up in the, um, in the, in the properties over here on the far right. And the last thing I'm gonna show with Dynamo is I'm just gonna scroll out and go over ooh, really far and then come back in um, and just show you these are the the sent to format node here is how you drive that geometry from dynamo back into format and it will come in as a mesh or you can use um, one of the additional group op options here called set as mesh and this is a boolean that allows you to say set as mesh true or false basically so if it's not a mesh it will come in as a solid and there are a couple other elements here so you are nodes that you can set the set attributes for your element and you can also set layers as well. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna close that. I'll say yes, I'll save that. Um, what, I, what I think is really nice about the format Dynamo integration is that, you know, if I'm a design architect and I'm working in a design program and I'm, I'm sketching and modeling in 3D, you know, I, I may not want to go into a visual scripting environment to do, to do my job. Um, I may be more comfortable in this 3D modeling environment. So what this does is it allows me to use the power of mm -hmm. um, automation and design through Dynamo, but within the format um, interface. So I can use sliders and I can use inputs and I can use, again, get that computational sort of geometry, but without myself going into a Dynamo graph. The, and I know, let me just switch to one other thing and then I will, um, I'm just gonna show you a few examples of what some more advanced kind of custom nodes. I'm going to change my view here. Here we go. So this is showing a facade here and you can see that that facade has these different um, sort of planar, planar angles to it. And all of those planar angles, they're driven by a dynamo graph. So here we just go, went into the dynamo graph. Again, you can see that select node, which is gonna allow us to select a, um, a, a, a path that will show you that, um, that geometry. And back inside of format, you'll see that path is this path along the, the ground here. And I'm deleting those segments of the path and I'm gonna change that out to be a curved shape. And then what I can do is select each of the pieces of geometry that are based on that path and say, rerun the graph. Here I'm selecting that, that top roof line there and I'm clicking run. And that's gonna update those floor plates to be angled to be that curve with my new path. And I'm doing the same thing here with the glazing as well. That just shows you sort of what you can do with a more custom graph. And I'm going to show you just one more. And this is um, this is a, a custom script again that that calculates percent glazing. So here I select a face and I um, click run, and it gives me the percent glazing. So I can set well what is the maximum glazing percentage that I want, and then at the at the 
you know, the output of my graph can show me what is the current glazing percentage and whether or not that that's in compliance with the minimum that I stated. So here again, I can change the width of the glazing. Um, in this case, I just made the glazing larger. I kept the minimum percentage at 40. And now I can see that my glazing percentage is at 49. So I am meeting my goal. Here, I just changed my goal to be 50. So now I'm not meeting my goal. So this is again, just another example of a way you can start to use that Dynamo script um, to, for custom um, sort of informed analysis or informed design that you'd like to do. And all sort of while staying within that interface so the designer really maintains control and that the design technologist um, can write a script, but then the designer again, really maintains that control of the, um, of the, of the design. And I'll stop there as well. Um, so we have time for Tim. Thank you, I'm Heather. Excited. And Thank I know you. there are so many things that we could have gone on and on about format, right? But like, I think one of the things that is also a game changer in addition to the automation tools is the inner, um, inner, uh, operability between Revit and Formit, right? Going between the two. And we can see, we just got a comment. Um, can we import Revit models to Formit and use Dynamo scripts on the imported model? Um, so, so you I've absolutely, yeah, you absolutely can. Um, within, within Revit 2022, there's a button on the massing tab called 3D Sketch, and that allows you to take your Revit model and launch, it launches format with the context of your Revit model inside of that. I can put some links in the chat for you That guys. would be absolutely wonderful. And we'll make sure we share all of those links up on our LinkedIn page. So make sure you join that group. You can definitely find it through me. And we'll make sure if we haven't already, which I'm sure Allison is right on top of, we'll make sure we throw it in the chat as well. Before we move over to Timon, I'm going to ask one final poll. Do you use automation in your design process? Yes, no. I don't know, right? Maybe you think somebody- What, what is automation, knows. Dana? What is automation? I don't know, right? I have no idea. I use a computer. It like <laughs> automatically sends emails for me. Is that automation? Right? I mean, in some way, right? I love that. Well, and if you do, the 44-ish the percent of you, 20 and rising amount of you, let us know how you use automation, right? Do you, even if just you're letting us know the program, or what stage of your design you're using it at, right? Maybe you use Dynamo, maybe you use Grasshopper, maybe you, you use BIM link, right? I feel like that's automation in some awesome way, right? I love ID8. At end polling, I'm gonna share the results here. So we're, we're right at half and half. Yes, no. Hopefully Sonal and Heather so far have persuaded you that it's the way to go. You guys are going to go home and do some homework in terms of how you can add automation to your design process. Right. So. And can we encourage that 40%, 46% that said, yes, I use automation. Can you like define it a little bit in the chat? I'd love to see wonderful. how those 46% are defining it. Cause it might actually skew the other 46%. It, it, it's going to be interesting, but I, I'd appreciate that. Awesome. And Tim, and without further ado. All right. So everybody, um, this is going to be a really fast presentation. If you've ever been in a presentation with me, you're going to want to hold on. I also love engagement with the audience. So I have all of you over here on my left, the ones of you that I have your cameras on. If you turn your camera on, I will see you. I'll be able to kind of talk to you. I love that. Also, I'm watching the chat. I have that open really big over here. So if you put something over there, I'll see it as we're going. Um, all that being said, why don't we get started? Um, as Dana said, I'm a senior technical designer at Walter P. Moore, um, where I got to do all kinds of really cool stuff. And I've been running your desk university um, and so grateful to all the people that are presenting on that. With that being said, Walter P. Moore, for those who don't know, we, wor we work on really complex problems. And automation for us really has a lot to do with the projects we work on and the culture that we have. In our, across the, the U.S., across the world, because we have two, three international offices, um, we do infrastructure, structures, and diagnostics. I work in our structures group, and that includes facade, structural engineering, secure design, parking, and construction engineering. And we work together to deliver projects. And we found that the projects where we're able to be multidiscipline, we've been able to be most successful at automation because of the ways that we can flow things from one group into the other. Like for example, um, steel frames into our construction services. 
So that being said, today for the presentation, I'm gonna focus quickly on three parts. So two is kind of my introduction, and then the third part are some examples and practice, and we'll just take as many of those as we can get, and then we'll cut it off when Dana cuts the time off or I'm watching my clock right here. Um, that being said, um, first of all, does your culture allow for design automation? Um, at Walter P. Moore, our culture is designed for anybody to raise it up. Uh, that we really follow kind of the lean practices um, and Six Sigma, if you've looked at any of that stuff, I've been learning it since I joined Walter P. Moore, um, really fascinating. And the idea that anybody can raise up and say, hey, the way we're doing this, it doesn't work. And everyone kind of is, is, is created and we're designed and taught to really listen to anybody who's saying, hey, I have a problem. It doesn't matter if they're at senior leadership or at the junior level. And that, um, that really goes across, the, across um, the hierarchy and you can see it um, in the way that things happen. Second, you can't go this road alone. And I found that communication is super key, especially in this kind of innovative culture where lots of people are encouraged to innovate in whatever way that they're innovating. Um, you can't really grow as a company in a direction unless one, there's direction and insight happening um, kind of collectively, but also if the people who are doing some kind of automation design um, aren't then voicing that to other people. And then we'll talk about examples in practice. Um, I've got 20, but we'll probably hit four or five and my idea, my thought here is really to, to whet your appetite a little bit. So why is it that we build these really beautiful models? And I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are all looking at this and going, yes. Why do we limit these models that we create from actually going to construction? There's, there's all this red tape that's limiting it. And until recently, I actually didn't believe that we were there already. But I can tell you from experience now, we are delivering these models in through construction. And there's a lot of things that have to happen, a lot of data that has to go into them, a lot of metadata and also verification if that you know, LOD 300 model is going to turn into an LOD 400 model and then go into construction. It cannot happen um, without a lot of extra work um, on the data management side of this. So, so why, why have we accepted this red tape and what can be done about it? Um, so at Walsh P. Moore, 15 years ago, there was a huge cultural shift and it really took off. And they said, we, from the top, we no longer create drawings. We create data. Our drawings are, uh, we used to say our drawings are accurate enough. It's a common statement, but no, our models now need to be fabrication friendly. Um, we don't work on our own platforms. We work where our clients are. So if our client is in Tecla because of construction engineering, we're going to be working in Tecla. If our client's in Rhino because that's where the architect is, that's where we're going to be working. And that's really important to be kind of in that same um, network. And with Rhino inside, things have gotten just so much easier with that. A lot of people saying sharing information is risky. You've probably heard this. And like, I know, I know who I'm speaking to here. So you guys are like, yes, you know, this is what we, we are all in agreement. Um, but I've been really appreciative from the top to hear like, hey, not sharing information actually is risky. We know these things about construction. If we can't get that out um, and we're just delivering a drawing that's a 2D printout, then um, that actually adds more risk. Um, and then just in general, that one, I'm gonna skip that one. So from those things, what about our culture has allowed um, innovation to foster and automation to happen at really the grassroots level? Um, first of all, control only what needs to be controlled. Um, we often um, like to think like this standard has to be upheld, this help hint standard has to be upheld because of whatever reason. But if, but if it really doesn't have to be controlled, then think about the limited things of things that have to be controlled and then everything else allow for it to be flexible. Um, and like, yeah, I'll just allow for it to be um, flexible and then also empower all users. Um, kind of a weird example of that is all of our users, including myself, have admin privileges on our computers. Why? Because IT is saying like, oh no, we don't know the like 10 things everyone needs installed. Everyone's gonna kind of need a little bit of a different setup. And so that just is one example of how that looks in, um, in, our, in our culture. I just wanna check, am I sharing the right screen? Okay, because it looks like I'm sharing that screen and not the full size screen. Um, so with innovation happening at every project level, it's really important for that communication to get to a bigger network. 
um, right? We want people to be innovating. We don't want um, everything to be just uh, kind of this secluded group that does innovation and isn't related to the project. But then that project, that information has to get out to other people. And I really want to talk about this because I think like, it's great to talk about automation. It's great to talk about how can I improve myself? But I think the people who are on this call, you're probably saying like, hey, I am doing this or I want to be doing this, but you know that you need a bigger network around you to be able to make it happen. One of, and the way we get our communication out is three ways. And I'm going to focus on the red meetings here. The red meetings are our largest all office meetings. Um, usually there's about 150 to 200, but everyone in the structures group is invited to that meeting. And it's, it's kind of a high level introduction of a better practices happening on any project. So any project is then getting that information out in front of everybody and it's well attended. And, um, but that's, that's kind of like an all hands, everybody presentation um, kind of conversation, short to the point, high level. If you wanna know more information, go and talk to the expert who spoke at that. The other meetings here you're seeing are smaller groups. Um, they're PM meetings, they're technical designers, which is kind of what we call computational designer people. Um, and then BIM, BIM meetings for those ideas to then get spread because you, for a project to really adapt to a new workflow, it can't just go to your BIM people or your PMs. It has to really be heard by all people, but they're all going to hear it a little bit differently. Um, and and, and I think that, that that's really important to, to kind of spread it out across, um, again, the, 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 the seniority in your office when there's an idea. When we talk about automation and the types of things that happen, I'm looking at three kind of like the spectrum, everything from project specific ad hoc automation. So whether it's Dynamo, Grasshopper, Rhino inside, um, it might be a C-sharp plugin or something that's in Excel. Uh, maybe someone built a workflow in um, Microsoft Flow so that they could handle project management duties better. Um, those are the kind of things that we're talking about when we think about automation, not just, oh, look at this really cool geometry I made. Um, oh, wait, it doesn't apply to most of our projects. I mentioned BIM link, right? BIM link is, is a great way to get automation in and out and making changes, um, definitely. Um, grassroots growing reusable automation, that middle section, that's what I'm thinking of when like something is slightly growing. So it's been used on one project, it's improved on a second project, it's approved to a third. Um, because our automation happens on one project, it might not be instantly adaptable to a second project. So there might be a little bit of growth that happens and those are the more reusable things. And then on the right side, fully customizable applications. So this might be a structural um, design software that we built in house. It might be something else that's really a full application, maybe a web app um, that allows us to do something. Um, and that's kind of the spectrum of automation when I think about automation. I'm gonna pause here and look at the questions quickly while I uh, leave this up for a second. Looks like it's mostly conversation. There is a question about how general contractors are using automation. Do you have any thoughts on that, Timon? Have you that's, had- That's a really good question. Um, I will talk a little bit about how our models go into construction through automation, like automatically doing some of the detailing, automatically doing some of the connection design. Um, and then we do a ton on the, this fourth bucket here, data analytics, if it's gonna go into construction for automation, um, because we need to make sure that the project managers can own the data that's being sent out of the office, right? It, the, every like senior leadership has to be able to own that data and not just, you know, a few people who are entering all the data because they really know how to use, you know, Excel into, into Revit, maybe with BIMLink or another tool like Dynamo or something else. So when I think of at Walter P. Moore, we use the term digital practice. When we're talking about all of this, it encapsulates at least these five categories. I did take off the things that are not project delivery automation focused. So like project management um, types of automation um, and things like that. So within these five, what I've done for you today is looked at this across LOD levels. So what kind of automation are we doing at LOD 100? What could you be doing? Because um, I really want to inspire you. Like um, if, if you don't walk away from this and change something about the way you do things, then it's, it's a really a lost cause. Um, and I'm just talking to myself, which, you know, kind of- Never odd. that, Timon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then if something's in one of these buckets, it doesn't mean that's the only place where it happens, but it was just an example of something that's happening at that spot um, in, the, in our company. Um, and so across these, 
I'm going to pull out just a couple here. So starting with this LOD 100 modeling and coordination. So when we are working on a project and there's not a lot of fee, but we need to be able to start talking about a story, then we might look at something like this, which is a grasshopper script that looks at intersection of curves and levels and then just copies that all up. So this is not high fidelity. It's not high accuracy. It's intended to be there so that you can tell a story. So that then later that can come into a PowerPoint and you can start talking about the story, but you didn't spend three or four days creating the model to be telling that story. And if you want to talk about the foundations or you wanted to zoom in and talk about some part of the building, you can do this because you have some kind of model to discuss on, on that building. So this was um, one of our project examples that kind of that LED 100 really fast. Um, I'll, I'll answer that in a little bit, Chris. So um, at LED 200, and really this project went into 300 um, with this process, but we went from masses from SketchUp that were coming in using Rhino inside um, to basically split the building, divide it up and construct the entire mass. So all of the, everything you're seeing here was generally, I don't wanna use the word generative. It was generated um, using Rhino inside um, instantly from some kind of SketchUp model just by like, I don't know, I guess form to structure, if you want to call it that. Um, but, but not really like a hundred percent repeatable in every project. Most of this is repeatable, but I don't want to like, we could create some tool that shows you structure getting created, but this was actually a, a delivered process, but it only worked because I actually have two stories here because everyone sat down together. They thought through, okay, what pieces do we need to do and how can this be achieved? So the project managers sat with the computational designers in order to deliver this. It couldn't be just a PM story saying, hey, we're going to deliver it this way. It couldn't have just been a computational designer saying, hey, I have an idea. And everyone like, okay, yeah, try that somewhere else. Um, it's not going to work for our project. People were willing to take that risk. And what you're seeing in front of you here is the building. And then you can see all the sections kind of automated to the left. And then if you look into the distance, you can actually see all the floor plans that are getting generated um, so that it's, it's, it can be really iterative to see all of that. And then in red um, in the back, you're seeing all the transfer columns that help to highlight the issue that this particular building was, was facing. A second one, very similarly, um, Steve Smith in Orlando office, um, just a really smart guy, this kind of stuff. And he sat down with his PM team and said, whoa, we have this convention center project coming up. Can we sit down and sketch out what it might look like? I think this might be a really great example for automating the entire structure. Um, and they sat down and they talked about where it was going to be, where it was going to be um, kind of, there was going to be similarity, where there were going to be uniquenesses, where they expected changes to happen um, and where they expected um, things to be more flexible. And this footprint changed three or four times, but they were able to do this like with one fifth of the resources of what kind of a similar project would have taken um, to get to, to that level. So those would be like the LOD 200 level. Um, I'm looking here at the time. I'm going to jump at a couple more of these. So I know to a lot of us, this is one that we have in house, but there's a, there's a public, a few publicly available options for it. Um, a lot of us spend significant amount of time printing, doing exports, slip sheeting, maybe deleting old markups, you know, doing these QC tools. And our team saw the same problem on this specific project. They found that they were spending 2% of the project time on what I would call internal waste. And they were like, this is, this is not okay. This is not how we're going to do this. And so like menial tasks, like renumbering, renaming. Yes. Like it's stuff that none of us really want to be doing. Tasks, setting views on sheets, creating views. Ex exactly. Um, and so they looked at, and I'll just share like the publicly available ones. I know um, imagine it has um, something that does this kind of automation. Um, I'm sure there's other ones. Uh, there was a Revit batch processor that's available freely on GitHub. Um, our team found that those didn't quite deliver what we needed. And we had a, we have like a corporate IT um, software development team that then said, fine, you know what, we're just going to build this in house. Um, and they've started building different um, kind of plugins that can go with that, those pieces. So the first project, maybe it was just automatic printing. The next project, it was something more. Um, a couple others just quickly. Um, is that okay, Dana? 
Yep. We have about two minutes. We have like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, So one would be once we're collecting because of the way that we work, actually, I'm going to go back because of the way that we work and we specify an index for every single element inside of our project. So this is like a ton of work on the forefront until it got automated, but every single thing gets designated, the phase, the zone, the level, how it works and how it goes into the building. Then because we have that data, we're able to do things like understand our um, embodied carbon for different parts of the building. Um, We're able to look at different elements in the building um, inside of another platform um, because we've had this consistent way of managing our data for probably, I mean, um, for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, um, all of our models have had kind of that, that kind of system for managing our data. Um, and then we did talk a little bit about construction. I know that came up. So I want to jump at this one, which if I jump back, that's the like modeling and coordination at 400 level. So this is where a lot of people, you know, we don't see things going. Um, so warning for non-structural engineers, uh, I'm sorry. Um, warning for structural engineers or engineers in general, like we need to be delivering more value as, as, a, as a group. Um, and so again, if we go back to that building, can you imagine having to rebuild all this waste uh, for construction and having to completely rebuild this model, just being receiving a few PDFs? So our team had both construction services and, um, and structural for this, for this project. So we're able to feed all that stuff using Rhino, using Grasshopper and um, into Tecla. I don't think Rhino inside was, quite out yet, um, but because of like our schema, we were able to build these tools that can go into different platforms all at the same time. And the entire thing was, was, was generated inside of Tecla and then sent out. Now I'm going to tell you right away, any construction guy on the team right here is probably going to say, oh my goodness, don't just generate a Tecla model and send it to me. There are so many things that they care about that have to be accurate and precise and way more um, detailed than what we're used to. Um, So make sure you check those kinds of things. Um, And then you're seeing right here kind of the same process um, on the rebar side of things where the whole thing is being 3D, where all the rebar is being modeled so that there can be coordination um, where maybe there's multiple disciplines um, interfering with each other. Um, And that really, that kind of automation is is really taking over and we're seeing seeing a lot more. Um, I'm going to pause there. I have a couple other here. If, if people have questions, Dan, if you want to, um, ping one or two, we could ping them, well, um, but I'll pause there. It's more or less conversation going on. going on in the, the chat, which is great. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. I would say that, that, you know, there are definite struggles in terms of sharing automation tools and how we create all of this internally. Walter P. Moore obviously has a pretty wonderful development team for them. And, and like do, maintenance is a big part. A huge That's a part. huge part. And finding platforms that are more maintenance friendly and learning those might actually help the entire project like move forward um, rather than, yeah, sticking to maybe one or two platforms. It it just, and then again, being able to tell anyone, hey, if you have a better way to do things on your project, then raise it up and maybe you don't have the skills to do it. We'll find some way to to make, to solve that better. Um, And that's, I think that's really made this kind of. I believe Simon awesome. earlier in the conversation said that he won't hire anybody with some sort of, whether it's a programming language or dynamo mm-hmm. or something under their belts to, to bring to the table in terms of automation mm-hmm. tools. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's really where we're going in our industry, right? I don't know whether Sonal, let Heather, you have any final thoughts or have anything to add to the last bit of the conversation. Um, but of course, Uh, Autodesk does a wonderful job with the forums. Um, Make sure that you're on the forums, you're checking out the forums, especially if you have a question. Don't be shy. Um, Do a little bit of work before you post up there. Um, Make sure that you're coming, you know, with with a decent question and with some backing to that question. But the community is so fantastic. Can I share one more little piece as we close and kind of like a call to action? Because I know there's tons of architects out there. So we're looking right now at how can we use your rooms to assign our loading inside of our models. So we want to take the data that you're already creating and providing, whether it's a room or an area, and then assign loads to that. If you want to be a part of that project and try to integrate in that way, um, we're, we're moving in that direction. We're really trying to actually, Sonal, this reminded me a little bit of what you were showing 
um, with your rooms. I was like, oh my goodness, they have a better app um, for visualizing these rooms, which obviously this is what you're spending, you know, so much of your time on. Um, but it just reminded me of, of, yeah. Anyways, that's my call to action of like, if you can get better data and I can get that data from you, my architectural clients, um, we, we'd love to use that downstream. So there's well, my I think once you mentioned about action. before earlier about if you have an, a tool that, you know, allows you to do something as a team, you know, we should be mm -hmm. sharing it at least as the yeah. team, right? Maybe you don't want to share it with the industry. That's okay. Um, as we're closing down this last minute, um, please make sure you fill out that survey. You could win a $25 gift card next month, randomly selected through Dynamo, through an automation process that's completely random and used only to select a winner. <laughs> make sure that you join our BIM XT group. We will share all of the links today as well as the recording um, that, you know, you can re get all of our previous recordings as well as any information shared within the presentation. So we will stay on here for a minute or two. If you guys have any final thoughts, thank you all to the participants and audience. And thank you, especially to Heather Sonal and Tim and our wonderful presenters today. Thank you, Dana, very much. Thank you everyone for your, for your comments and stuff. Like how, where did that out. hour go? I could talk about this for at least right. another hour, at least one more. <laughs> Definitely.